God's word, faithfully preached, is his comprehensive equipment for changing lives, delivering them from the shackles of sin, the flesh, and the world, and transforming them into useful vessels through whom Jesus can pour out his blessings. Living Seed invites you to a feast of the truth as God's servant brings to us the word of life. The Lord bless you. And I'd like to thank God for all of us that have gathered back again for this Bible study today. Again, we do recognize us from our various countries and various uh, centers where some of us are gathered. Some are gathered as discipleship centers in groups. Others are sitting together as families. And there are churches that have adopted this Bible study as their weekly studies. We do appreciate all of us. And as we gather again at the feet of the Lord, let's look to Jesus who manifests himself to us. For it is him unto him shall the gathering of his people be. I also want to thank God for our sisters and brothers that will be assisting as we walk together today, Brother Clarence from San Francisco and Sister Melissa and our sister from Belize, Sister Charlene. We want to thank all of you for coming in. I'd like us to please pray together before we pick the scriptures to start studying. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity you are giving us today again to press on with our study on this understanding the concepts and conditions for discipleship. We thank you, Lord, for the hand that you have stretched out towards us. We know that you are preparing to engage us, to prepare us, to train us, that we may take our space in the kingdom of God as joint heir with Christ Jesus that we might be able to work into the inheritance that you have reserved for us and for us to become useful citizens in the kingdom, serving you and bearing the burden of the Lord. Thank you for this opportunity again. Thank you for all our brethren that are connecting. Some are connecting through the YouTube. Some are on Zoom. Others are on MixLR some others on Telegram, on Facebook, and other platforms. We ask that wherever we are, those that are on their own, those that are in groups, those that are in church situation, those that are sitting together as families, Lord, we ask that you will not pass us by. Visit us individually. Those that have come into this Bible study with a need in their heart, with a need in their body or a need in their families. The Bible says God sends forth his word and he hears them. Send forth your word to us even today and let there be deliverance. Let there be the light that shines with darkness cannot comprehend. Let your mighty hand be released and be straight forth both to heal and to raise your people up and to Meet us at our point of need. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Just to remind you that we are looking at understanding the concepts and conditions of discipleship. And as at last week, we have come to begin to look at the definition and concept of discipleship and we are dealing with the definition and concept and we have come to the point number six on page 27 of the material if you have it on your hand and we are going to begin from that point and we are also studying concurrently becoming like Jesus we are taking them side by side because they are a parallel text that we are dealing with. And when we are set, we will be coming to again pick 
some few issues out of becoming like Jesus. And if you have the book, we stopped on page 53. And we are about to start looking at discipleship. It's a process. When we get there, we'll pick it up again. So please, if you have your two materials, keep them by your side so that as we study with your own Bibles, we'll be able to press on by the grace of God. Now, just to give you a quick brief on where we are before we kick off today, we have been looking at what is the definition and the concept and the basis of discipleship. And we noted discipleship as a means of growing the heir, of growing the child of God to become like Jesus. Because the divine purpose of God for everyone that he has called is that we might become conformed to the image of his son Jesus. And we noted last week that the only means of transforming and getting us to conform to his likeness is this means of discipleship. Though at new birth, all the potentials of the divine nature is implanted within the soul of every child of God. It is undeveloped and immature. It is the discipleship process that brings this into maturity by exercise and by training. So we are noting that discipleship is that means, is that process that takes a child who has come to Christ, who has experienced the new birth, onto the point of maturity where he is no more tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. But rather than mere head knowledge, discipleship does not just try to impart the head with biblical knowledge. Discipleship handles the entire personality of a person until Christ is formed in him in every area. We noted last week that the standard height is the stature of Christ. The personality that we can see in Christ Jesus is what God is driving our lives to becoming. And if anybody is making progress at all, that's the yardstick by which we measure whatever progress we are making in our relationship with the Lord. We said that because it is not just an intellectual uh, knowledge, even though we are sitting down, we are doing Bible studies, we are turning from one scripture to another, the purpose is not the head. It's not head knowledge. The purpose is a transformation that is from the heart. A transformation that brings us to be conformed inwardly into the pattern, into the lifestyle, and into the image and likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We said it has to be an inward, inward transformation that radiates on the outside to such a point that people can know when we have made progress. They say, surely this man is actually behaving like Christ Jesus. So today we are going on. And we will start by looking at the fact that discipleship is a process. That discipleship is a process. Because the conformity to his image and to his likeness will not take place in one event or in one experience. Whereas to be born again is a one event, is one experience that happens when you have an encounter with God. But growing to become like Jesus, to be transformed and conformed to his image, both in act, in action, in mind, in thought, in perspective, that will not happen as one event. It will happen as a process, a cumulative uh, process. Now, 
I'd like you to please correct some little mistake that was made in the material, particularly in this one. The passages that you have seen that were noted there, Hebrews 12, 6, Psalm 118, verse 18, Job 5, verse 17 to 18, Proverbs 3, 12. All those passages were supposed to have been brought under point number three, where we dealt with discipleship is God's family training scheme. Where we talk about if you are a son, you are a partaker of the discipline. That which son, as the father accepted, that he does not discipline. So we are noting that those passages will be better placed under the family training scheme. So when we are going to do a reprint, that will be corrected. But if you have your book with you, we want you to put those passages in bracket while you now replace it with the following passages that we are going to refer to today. Lamentation, chapter 3, we are going to look at verse 27 to verse 30. Lamentations 3, 27 to 30. Isaiah 50, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4 to 6. Then Isaiah 28, verse 9 to 10. Now those are the passages that we are going to use to develop the thought under that number 6. Now as we go on studying, we are hoping that as we maybe add one passage or the other, you'll be able to do that into your own material because you will always need to go over it again and again by the grace of God. So for us to begin this day, we're going to begin by looking at Lamentations 3, verse 27 to 30. And I'm asking Sister Melissa, to help us pick that up and we'll ask Brother Clarence to read Isaiah 50, 4 to 6 and Isaiah 28, 9 to 10, Sister Shali. Discipleship is a process because the conformity to his image will not take place in one experience. Let's pick those scriptures together. Lamentations chapter 3, Sister Melissa. Lamentations 3 verse 27 says, It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and keep silent, because God has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him and be full of reproach. Thank you very much. You are going to read it for us when I come back to that from the Amplified Scripture. Brother Clarence, would you like to pick Isaiah 50 for us, verse 4, 5, and 6? Isaiah 50, 4, 5, and 6 says, The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned, mm. that I should know how to speak a word in season to him, that is weary. He waketh morning by morning. Mm -hmm. He waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened mine ear that I might not rebel, neither turn away back. I gave my cheek to be to the smitter and gave my back to the smitter and my cheeks to them that pluck off the hair. I hid not my face from shame or spitting. Right. Thank you. Let's check Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10. This yeah. is from the New King James. All right. Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk? Those just drawn from the breast? For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. 
Here a little, there a little. Thank you very much. Amen. Now, we are looking at discipleship as a process, as something that is a cumulative, systematic step of steps. Exposures, training that is carefully arranged in order until God's goal is achieved. And let's now go back to the passage that we have read. Those three passages, they will help us to note how does God want to engage the discipleship of his children. Now, the first, you remember that when we read Matthew 11, verse 29 and 30 before, when we said discipleship is to be likened to a teacher puppy relationship and or a master apprentice relationship and he said take my yoke upon you and learn of me for i am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my body is light we said that the yoke is not the yoke of bondage it's not the yoke of compulsion. It's a yoke that you voluntarily take upon yourself to learn. You will notice I said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So we saw that the discipleship yoke is a yoke for learning. It's a commitment for learning. So let me now request our sister to please Go to Lamentations chapter 3, verse 27, and let's contrast what we have read in the Amplified Version in order to, to give us an insight to what kind of yoke are we talking about. Sister Melissa, can you check your Amplified Version? It is good for a man that he should bear the yoke of divine disciplinary dealings in his youth. All right. So you notice now that the yoke that we are saying it is good for a man to take or to bear is defined in the Amplified Bible as the yoke of divine disciplinary dealings. It's a divine disciplinary dealings. Now, the word disciplinary here is not about punishment. It's not punitive. It's about a training of life until some certain disciplines, certain life routine, certain life focus is inculcated until it is inculcated because what we are talking about is a transformation that is not just temporary. A conformity to the image of Christ that will become your permanent feature of life. So because what we are looking for is something that is going to remain with you for life. Something that will be carved into your life, into your heart. That the more you grow, the more those features will be developing the more it will be made manifest and the more conformed to Christ's likeness will you become. So these disciplinary dealings, they don't happen once. And they are not just one discipline. It is dealings, dealings that we must be patient to go through it until what God is working out what God is carving into our lives is actually established. So discipleship is actually a divine process of writing Christ's character, writing Christ's perspective, Christ's personality, inscribing, carving it, writing it on the tables of our hearts. That's why we are saying this is not just about mental knowledge. It's not about something we write on paper. He said this epistle is being written not on the tables of stone, but on the tables of the flesh of our heart. 
That is the process. So when you come into discipleship, you need to get to know that you are coming under God's hand who is going to be working on your life meticulously, meticulously, until all that God wants to carve and inculcate into your life is actually done and is not done to be rubbed off. It's going to be indelible. It's going to remain permanent. And once Christ's life begins to be made manifest in your life, it's not that which appears to disappear. It will keep growing. And every challenges you meet in life, we only make it come out better and more glorious. So because of that, now look at how verse 28 now put it, Sister Melissa, go ahead. Let him sit alone, uncomplaining, and keeping silent in hope, because God has laid the yoke upon him for his benefit. Let him put his mouth in the dust, in abject recognition of his unworthiness. Mm -hmm. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who smites him, even through his human agents. Mm. Let him be filled full with men's reproach and meekness. All right. So again, we are saying that right in that passage, it's clear that because it's a process, it doesn't happen only once. So there's need for the disciple itself who has taken that yoke to be patient, to be uncomplaining, to keep silent because it is God that is laying this yoke upon him for his benefit. That discipleship is for the benefit of the disciple. That we might become partakers of God's holiness and partakers of his nature. As we read last week from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 to 11. Now it says, let him put his mouth in the dust in the abject recognition of his unworthiness. Let him know that Yes, if I was already qualified, I don't need this training. But because of what God needs to make me that I'm not yet, let him put his mouth in the dust. As if let him submit unto every dealing that God will be bringing. Let him give his cheek to the one who smites him, even through his human agents. So we are noting from the passage here that discipleship, even though it's between you and the Lord, sometimes God engages his human agents to make it to happen. So when we read in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 last week, and we talked about tutors and governors, we noted that these tutors and governors, they could be human agents that God has appointed in order to engage our training and to bring us to the kind of man and woman he wants us to be in Christ Jesus. And these human agents, which we will later on define as disciples, people that God has planted on your path to also take upon themselves the responsibility of helping you both with their own life example and with their own experience, pointing you more and more to Christ. They are not to possess you. They are not your owner. It is not like them you want to become. It's like Jesus that God is making you, but they are helpers. They are your nest of key. You could see that in flesh and blood, they have gone through the experience you are going through, and they have uh, somehow, by the grace of God, gone ahead of you, so they can help you to see, you know, steps to take in becoming like Jesus. So when we talk about we will be needing human agents in discipleship, it is God who appoints them for us. They don't impose themselves on us at all. They don't replace the Lord Jesus in our lives. They don't become our Lord. Actually, they are not the teacher that we are trying to become like. They are only helpers. 
In fact, they are the friends of the bridegroom who must continually decrease as the bride and the bridegroom get connected. When you begin to hear your master very well and you begin to grow in relationship with him and you are becoming more and more like Jesus, their own input into your life, it may not be completely removed, but it's no more dominant because what they are there to help you do, you are already getting at it. And you also, you are beginning to be responsible to take on other lives, other disciples that you are also helping along the way. So he said, let him give his cheek to the one who smites him. And if you look at the word, the one in the passage, you will notice that that one is capital which means it's the Lord. It's the Lord that may use human agents to smite us, to train us, to smack our lives, and to help us to become conformed to his image. I don't know whether you are seeing that now. So when a disciple or a human agent is doing something, don't always look at him. He's not the one. He's the one, the big one, our Father in heaven, our main disciple, the one to whom we have given our lives, whose yoke we have taken. He might use this brother, or might use this sister to help us. So you may see the hand of the disciple as if he's the one smiting you. But no, he is just like a, an instrument. The one who is using that instrument is the Lord himself. And that's the one you must see all the time so that you can keep growing. So because it's a process, it's not a one and for all time experience. It is going to come over and over and over again. Now I think if we take Isaiah 50 again, it might be of help to us. Let's go to Isaiah 50. Uh, Brother Clarence, you must have opened Isaiah 50. Can you also check from your Amplified Bible if you can get Isaiah 50? and read verse 4 for us the servant of God says uh -huh. the Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple did you see now and of one now you will notice that when we read it from the King James he said the Lord God had given me the tongue of the learned but now we are seeing that that learned actually is disciple said the Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple and of one who is taught. Go ahead, reading. That I should know to speak a word in season to him who is weary. Uh -huh. He wakes me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to hear as a disciple, as one who is taught. Did you see now? That means that the training, this discipleship we are talking about, uh, apart from training our lives to become like Jesus, he trains our tongue to know how to speak. So this discipleship is training you holistically. It's training the way you reason. It's training the way you speak. It's training the way you can minister to those that are weary. So that when you are speaking, you speak a word in season. When they say, that man is a seasoned minister. You don't become a seasoned minister simply because you went to one Bible school. You become seasoned because day by day. And I want you to see the process. Uh, Brother Clarence, read that verse 4 again and let us highlight the process. Verse 4. Yes, sir. He yes. wakens me morning by morning. He wakens me morning by morning. Now, does that show that it's a continuous process? It shows that it is not just one time lecture. It means that money by money, it wakens your ears. It wakens you up. Money by money. Money by money. To hear as a disciple, as one who is taught. So you can see that this daily routine, this daily discipline, is part of the process of discipleship that will make you become like Jesus. 
to make you become, you know, conform to his image, to make you to become one who can speak a word in season to those that are weary. You won't be speaking of course because God had been waking you up morning by morning, morning by morning, morning by morning. So it will look like your own daily discipline or your daily routine. And those of us that have gone a little further with God in our discipleship relationship with him, we can testify to you that morning by morning. And I'm telling you for so many years, I have seen God very consistent. He will come and wake you morning by morning. Sometimes we start by using alarm. But a time comes when you don't need alarm again. When God himself is one who is going to wake you up. Those of us that live in Africa, sometimes it's one mosquito that God will send to blow around your ears. And you just jump up. And you will notice that that's the time God normally comes to wake you up. And others say, well, one angel will just come and wake him up. For me, the angel could be my own mosquito that comes around the bush and is singing my ears. And I know that it's, it's God. Some say, well, it is it's, uh, their dog that will come and put the wet nose around them and then they will wake up. And it is God. Whatever God uses to wake you money by money. Or it may be your electronic alarm that you have set on your phone or you have set uh, on your clock, whatever it is. But the major issue is that it is God that wakens our ears morning by morning, morning by morning. Now, why am I emphasizing this? I want you to know that discipleship, rather than just going for one-time ministration and a big man of God lays hands on you and you fell under the anointing and say you have been discipled, that is not the biblical a concept of discipleship we know. It is not one-time ministration. It is not one-time anointing service that you go for. No. This is a life training. Just as life is formed, even physically, not one day. It takes your years to keep growing cumulatively. So in the same way, discipleship requires that cumulative continuance that God himself engages because of what he wants to make you. It's a process. I'm emphasizing that because it's important. Now, go reading verse 5 and verse 6 for us before we go from there. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I have not been rebellious mm. or turned backward. Yes. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheek to those who plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. You will notice that Isaiah 50 is almost a repetition of Lamentation chapter 3 that Melissa has read for us. That's to tell you that the process of discipleship is the same everywhere. That also uh, shows a liking to what we have read in Hebrews chapter 12. And in um, Psalm 118, verse 18, that we say we are going to carry back to the family training scheme. Now, discipline, including chastisement, they are all part of this. Not so as to condemn you, but to give you an assurance of becoming conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus, that we may become partakers of his holiness, partakers of his... Uh, of his inheritance and partakers of his divine nature. Now, one more line that we need to deal with in Isaiah 28, which our sister Shalene has read. And I please request her to return to that chapter 28 and verse 9 for us. Uh, we are going to pick it from the New King James that she has read. Okay, verse 9. Whom will he teach knowledge? Yes. And who will he make to understand the message? Uh -huh. Those just weaned from milk? Those just drawn from the breast? For precept must be upon precept. Okay. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. 
Here a little, there a little. Now, again, you will see three issues that is coming out there. That this discipleship process is systematic. And it's a line upon line. There are things that because of your present level of development, you cannot yet bear. So when you are still a baby, what God will be giving you, which is part of discipleship, is meek. It will be giving you meek that you might be growing. And as you are developing, it will continue to bring further things. When you are drawn from the breast, then God can begin to confront you with deeper things. So we saw when Jesus Christ was dealing with his disciples, he said, there are many things I need to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. You will remember that when they first came, there are things he did not confront them with. But towards the time he was about to leave, when they have been with him for about three years, three and a half years, he began to tell them harder things. Because by this time, they have capacity to bear it. And yet there are yet other things I say, I cannot tell you now, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he will show you the truth. So which means that even in discipleship, there is room for growth. There is a kind of program that God himself has set as per the growth of each individual. So this process is very important. I said, for uh, precept must be upon precept. You know the meaning of that? That means a precept will only be brought on top of another precept. Because there are certain lessons to learn now that is going to be the basis for the next lesson. So when a disciple is not done with the first lesson, he cannot move to the next. So even when you see yourself as if you are going around, it's because the next preset cannot come because this first preset is not properly laid. That's why discipleship is a process. That's why it has to be uh, uniquely individual, which we are going to go through in the next point. So because of that, the discipleship focuses on you as a person. This is why, even though we may all go to church, and we should go to church, we should be in the fellowship of the brethren every time, yet, <coughs> discipleship must focus on you as an individual, so as to access your level of, as a, your level of receptability. What can you take in? If you are seeing one that can take only meek, it will not be useful for them to be forcing bones to your throat. If you are the one that is already able to chew some level of meat, it will be a waste for them to be giving you meek all the time because meek will no longer satisfy your level. So discipleship has to make room for individual growth. We may not all be at the same level of spiritual growth and receptivity, but discipleship takes care of it because he deals with you as an individual as per your level. That's why discipleship is much more critical than just being a church member. You can't be in church and the man of God is just preaching every week. Sometimes he's speaking above your head. Sometimes he's saying something that is below your need. So he just amuses you, but he's not remitting your real need. Because no one is focusing on you as a person. That's why when Jesus said, Go ye into the world and make disciples. Disciples are to be made one by one. Because each one of us is unique. And the process of making you what God wants you to be cannot be undermined. This is the issues that we are raising here. That it's a process because the conformity to his image will not take place in one experience. Let me request Sister Melissa 
to read the summary under that section for us. It consists of a systematic set of steps, exposures, and training, mm -hmm. carefully arranged in order until God's goal is achieved. It is not a program, nor a course, or an activity. Mm -hmm. It is a relationship. It is a life connection which is neither physical nor visible. It is an inflow of the divine new lifestyle in exchange for the old lifestyle of the disciple. This exchange of lifestyle involves most of the time falling and rising, correction and whipping. You may sometimes weep and bleed. It can be painful to bend to a new shape and focus. A man who is set on his old ways of living Oh, sorry, let me say that again. It can be painful to bend to a new shape and focus a man who is set on his old ways of living. Mm. Discipleship calls for a very close association with the Master. That's very good. Thank you very much, Sister Melissa. Those are the critical needs. That's why it has to be a process. Even if you failed or you fail. In one point, you are not abandoned because he will pick you up again. He said, the righteous man may fall seven times, but God does not abandon or forsake him because the process of transforming him continues. If you don't run away, if you are not rebellious, if you don't turn yourself back, as we read in all those three scriptures, say, I did not turn myself back. I did not pull away. I gave myself to him who smite my cheek or who is pulling out my bears. All of that means that as long as the disciple is bearing that yoke, God takes responsibility until you are formed and transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Let's go to point number seven. Discipleship involves direct encounters and direct interactions with the Lord. It involves direct encounters and interactions with the Lord, with the Master. Now, we are going to pick it up again. Brother Clarence, John 8, verse 31 and 32. Sister Shali. John 15, 8 to 10, and 1 Peter 2, 21, Sister Melissa. Can we try to pick the scriptures? Yeah. John 8, 31 and 32 says, Then said Jesus to the Jews who believed on him, If ye continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed, mm -hmm. and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Right, thank you. John 15, verse 8 to 10. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you, and ab abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his name. Okay. And first with that 221, Sister Melissa. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leading us an example that you should follow his steps. Thank you. That we should follow his steps. Or follow in his steps. The old King James added uh, that small word that we should follow in his steps now what's the implication of that first we are noting that jesus said if you continue in my word then are you my disciples indeed which means discipleship involves a following a continuing it's not an intermittent experience. It's not one time I just came and then you went away again. No. 
You will not be his disciples indeed unless you continue in his word. You persist. You persevere continuously. What it means then is that a disciple actually needs a continuous direct encounter with God through his word. When we went to read the John 15, 8 to 10, that uh, Sister Charlene read for us, we saw that Jesus again was saying, Look, you are my disciples indeed. My Father will be glorified uh, when you bear fruit, when you abide in my love. And you know the emphasis that I saw in uh, verse 9 and verse 10, he said, uh, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Stay within my love circumference. Don't walk outside my love circle. So, you know, discipleship, I don't want to use the word possessive. But it's a relationship that is a growing relationship in our interaction with the Lord. Your love for Jesus is developing and he is also developing you in his love. He said, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you, abide in my love. If you keep my commandment, you shall abide in my love, just as I have kept uh, my Father's commandment and I abide in his love. I can see a desire to build an intimacy. Don't walk outside of my love. Don't walk, don't walk in a way that you'll be offending me. So, you know, discipleship requires that you are conscious that it's a relationship you are building with the Lord Jesus. It's a love relationship. And you want to walk within His love. You want to abide in His love. And then, verse 21 that we read in First Peter says, God has given us Christ. As an example, that we might walk in his steps. As if the way he walked, the things that he himself was walking in, that we should also follow or walk in his step. We should move in his step. That's what impression that the Holy Spirit is bringing there. That discipleship will be a life of direct encounter, you know, with the master himself. So let me request Mr. Shani to help us speak the summary under that point number seven. Discipleship is a life of direct encounters and interactions with the master himself in prayer, in his word, in service and in following in his footsteps. It is not by proxy. It cannot be made correspondence. It is one life rubbing on and changing another until it conforms to the desired shape. Please take note of that. That's very important. Encounters and interactions with the master himself in prayer, in his word, in service, and in following in his step, if you continue in my word, if you continue, if you continue to persist, if you continue to be connected with me, and you abide in my love, you do the things I want you to do, and if you are walking in my step, that's what a discipleship involves. And just like it is said there, it is not by proxy. Discipleship cannot actually be achieved by mere correspondence. It is one life rubbing on and changing another until it conforms to the desired shape. And so which means every disciple must be directly connected with the Lord Jesus. And even if we have brothers and sisters that God is using as human agent to aid our discipleship. 
why we interact with them, why we rub on them, they are only rubbing on us in order for us to see Christ. They must continue to help us to connect with Christ because your rubbing of life with Christ on a day-to-day basis is what we cause your life to become like is. I love the passage, but we didn't put there. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord in his world, we are being changed, we are being transformed, we are being transfigured constantly into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. Maybe you should please add that passage and let me ask Melissa to read it for us from the Amplified Version, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. We need this constant encounter, daily interaction with the Lord in His Word, in prayer, in walking in His footsteps, in obeying what He teaches us to do day by day. This is what we enhance discipleship, transformation to become like Jesus. Second Corinthians 3.18 in the Amplified Classic says, And all of us, as with unveiled face, because we continued to behold in the word of God, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are constantly being transfigured into his very own image, in ever-increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, if you give me one minute and look at what we are saying, all of us, that's very important, all of us, whether you have come to a level where you are discipling others, and you are a discipler now, or you are a disciple, that you are just growing up. All of us. There is no time any of us can afford not to keep this direct interaction with the Lord. Otherwise, we will become a problem to those that are coming around us. So, and all of us, as with unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the word of God. So you can see that John 8 has come back again. If you continue in my word. So because we continued to behold in the word of God as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. We are, look at that, we are constantly Constantly, not not once in a long while, we are constantly being transfigured. So which means this discipleship is very progressive. Uh, I must be constantly transfigured day by day. My life should not be stagnant. If I'm raising a disciple and I become stagnant, very soon I'll become a problem to him because he won't see anything fresh that will ginger him to continue his own pursuit of God. He will just see a monument that has become dry. We're just repeating the same thing over and over again. But if I'm constantly with unveiled face, continually beholding in the word of God as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, I am constantly being transfigured into his very own image in ever-increasing splendor. Brothers and sisters, I'm excited about that. That you can be transfigured in an ever-increasing splendor. So that what people saw about me last month, if you come close to me again this month, you have seen a brother who has who has developed further, who has grown, who is becoming more and more like Jesus. If I was gentle with you uh, one year ago, and if I have not stopped growing constantly, 
the gentleness you saw with me one year ago will have become more fine-tuned, to have become more and more like the gentleness of Christ, because I'm beholding him constantly in the word of God. So that constant interaction, and because of the way we have come today, he said, he wakes me up morning by morning. Which means this daily encounter with God is very, very important in discipleship. In discipleship. And this is what we are setting forth, that all those who want to grow well, all those who want to become uh, transformed into the likeness of the Savior so that they can enter into their inheritance, so that they can express the glory of God in the land of the living. So that the things that God is demanding for them to carry out in life, they are able to walk into it. This discipleship process is something you cannot suspend. We've got to do this constantly. Thank you. Now let's go to point number eight. And in this point we said, discipleship for each person is unique and peculiar. You will notice that from all that I've been discussing, discipleship cannot be done as a lump. Because we are not a lump, each one of us, each one of you, you are uh, God's handiwork. You are not just a prototype of another person. You are a unique person. You are a particular member of the body of Christ. The functionality you are going to contribute to the body of Christ is also unique. So your discipleship for each person is unique and peculiar to that person. This is where the matter of discipleship must be taken very seriously. I know for many people they don't understand that the uniqueness of bringing up individuals in their context for their God-given role and for their space in the body of Christ, which no one else can take. If we don't understand that uniqueness, we will always be looking for a crowd ministry. I know it is easier and it looks wonderful to stand up and just preach to 1,000 or 10,000 people and say, oh, this man is the pastor of the largest growing church. But there is no individual touch on the individual members. That's not what God is looking for in his body. Every single individual member is being trained to become like Jesus. And the rate of their growth, the pace of their development and the level of their intake, their spiritual intake per time is not equal. It's not equal. And so we need a discipleship that focuses on each person uniquely and peculiarly. And so what we are talking about discipleship is not one big congregational program. It's not the kind of, okay, we just have one discipleship class and 5,000 people are in a discipleship class. That has a little blessing. But the real issue is that I must be ready to expose my life as an individual, being fine-tuned by God, even if God will use the hand of an human agent, this human agent is also learning to labor on my life, until Christ is formed in me and is able to relate with me as an individual. He knows my emotional temperament. He knows all the peculiarities of my life that have been a hindrance for Christ's likeness to be formed in me. And it is being treated, it's being handled. That's why in discipleship, each person's uh, uh, exposure is unique to him. The rate of their learning is unique to them. And the lessons that God presents to each person is peculiar. And we don't compare and contrast and say, you are not like this brother. The truth is that he is not like that brother. It's not like that sister. It should be taken 
in his own uniqueness and brought up and trained to become like Jesus. That's what the essence of discipleship is all about. And this is very critical in understanding the biblical concept of discipleship. That's why among the 12 disciples, Jesus gave attention to each individual. And we are going to see that very quickly now. The passages we are going to read, we are going to first, let's quickly go and read before we read the summary. The summary came first, but the passages, let's read the passages first before we come and read the summary. We are going to pick John 21, verse 15 to 25. Melissa, you will read that for us. We are going to pick John 20, verse 19 to 20, verse 24 to 29. Brother uh, Clarence, you will help us do that. And then, Shelley, you will go to Matthew 21 to 6. Let's quickly pick those scriptures. John 21, verse 15 starts, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second, again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Verse 20. Then Peter turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, mm -hmm. who also had leaned on his breast at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one, Lord, oh, he's the one who said, Lord, who is the one who betrayed you? Mm -hmm. Verse 21, Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the, dis the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did which, if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. All right. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Melissa. Before we go to the story of Thomas, let's look at uh, the uniqueness with which God was dealing with each of them. Do you know that the story we are reading started from chapter 21, verse 1? When Peter, after Jesus had left in chapter 20, and Peter just woke up and said, I'm going a fishing. And all the disciples around him said, we also will go with you. About seven of the disciples were led back to the riverside. Contrary to what God has trained them to do. As if they have gone back now. And they labored and toiled and toiled throughout the night. They caught nothing. Not even a single fish for them to eat. So by the time Jesus came, he said, Children, do you have any meat? And they said, No, we have been here. We have toiled all night. We have got nothing. There is no food to eat. And Jesus laid some fish on fire and roasted fish for them. And the Bible said, When he called them to come and eat, then Peter knew 
that ah this is the Lord because John, the disciple, said it's the Lord, it's the Lord. Now Jesus was going to deal with look at all of them, they all went back to the riverside. But when it was time for Jesus, he did not deal with Peter in their midst. Did you notice that he called him aside? And the discussion with Peter was exclusive to him. And for you to know that it's an exclusive discussion to him, he said he called him by his name. He called him and said, Simon, son of Jonas, as if, look, you have returned to what you used to be when I met you. You used to be Simon. Before I changed your name to Peter, but you went back now. You are now another. You have returned to Simon, son of Jonas. Do you love me more than this? You can see that he was focusing on Peter. And as he brought Peter back to the place of conviction, he gave him a personal assignment. He gave him a personal attention. What I'm saying is that discipleship is unique. The way Jesus was culturing and developing Peter, Simon Peter, was not the same way he dealt with Andrew. It wasn't the same way he dealt even with John. It's not the same way he dealt with Thomas. They were 12, but each one of them is unique with him. You can see that Jesus gave attention to each one of them. You remember that Philip was the one that said, show us, show us the Father. And Jesus said, Philip, you have been with me for this long, so you don't know the Father. Yet he still answered his question. Thomas said, show us the way. We don't know the way. And Jesus still spoke to, to Thomas and you will see how he dealt with each one of them. So even when you say Thomas is a doubting Thomas, no matter his doubts, Jesus could contain him among the team and dealt with him until he overcame his doubts. So the question I'm raising here is that the uniqueness and the peculiarity of individuals in discipleship requires that even their discipleship process must also be peculiar to them, must also be unique to them, and we should not be offended that this one is not moving at the same pace with that one. The reason is because they are not the same. And you must have a space in your heart if God is calling you to raise disciples, you must create a space, a room for individuals in your heart. Each person must have their room in your heart. Each one can enter the room in your heart and undress and they will not feel betrayed. Each one of us may have a sense of belonging to you as to the Lord and they will not feel that, look, I'm not meeting up to the standard of this other person. Discipleship does not bring comparative analysis between disciples. We might be an inspiration to the growth of each one but we are not in competition. We are not in competition. We are actually individually unique and we are growing in our uniqueness. And it is our uniqueness and our peculiarity that honors the Lord. He is not producing a prototype. So when he finished dealing with Peter, he even told him the kind of death he, Peter, was going to die. He even showed him what was particular about him. He said, when you are young, you used to go anywhere you like. There is that spuriousness in Peter. And there's that kind of, uh, Peter can just stand up and say, let's go and do this now. Sometimes it, it could be careless, it could be thoughtless. And Jesus knew that for him. Say, so when you were young, you went anywhere you like. But when you will be old, when you will be matured, you will become a man that will step forth your hand and somebody will guard you and tie your loins and lead you to where you don't plan to go. That will be your growth. He was talking that to Peter. 
That was not what he would tell Thomas. Let's look at how Jesus was going to deal with Thomas in that chapter 20, verse 19 to 20, and verse 24 to 29. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were, a symbol for, the, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. And there were, and the, and the disciples were glad when they all saw the Lord. Verses 24 to 29. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, Didymus, was not there when Jesus came. Mm. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see his hands and the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his sides, I will not believe. And after eight days again the disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then Jesus, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not fearless, faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Thank you. Again, I want you to see a very beautiful picture here. What is the picture? Of the uniqueness and the peculiarity of discipleship as we saw Jesus raising men for God. What was this? When Jesus came in chapter 20 verse 19, we don't know where Thomas went. And we don't know why Thomas was not in the midst of the disciples where everyone else had been. Could that be a personal weakness in the life of Thomas that he is, he is someone that is always roaming up and down? He can't settle. So when Jesus came, that very glorious time where he was going to breathe upon them and impart them and commission them, Thomas was not there. So when Thomas came and they said, look, we have seen the Lord. Oh, the Lord Jesus came here. In fact, we saw his hand. Oh, we saw he spoke with us. In fact, he breathed upon us. When they gave that testimony, look at what Thomas did. I love Thomas. Thomas said, well, you have seen him, but I was not there. I'm not going to believe unless I see. And if even if he comes here, I don't want apparition. I don't want a kind of a, a, a hallucination. I will want to put my hand and trace the Napier's hands. I would like to see where the tongue was put on his head and all the wounds. I like to put my hand on his side to see where they pierce him. Otherwise, I would not believe he's the same. And for the next eight days, while all others were jubilating and said, We have seen the Lord, we have seen the Lord, Thomas was in their mirror and said, mm, Well, you have seen him, but I have not seen him. If, if, if I don't see him, I can't join this uh, jubilation. No, I can't. He was real to himself. And why was he real? It's the kind of discipleship that Jesus gave them. The discipleship that Jesus gave them was seeking internal conformity rather than external uniformity. Jesus did not first work on external uniformity in such a way that even when you are not internally convinced or internally converted or internally conformed, you join the crowd. So you wear the same uniform. 
which was the basis of general hypocrisy that we are finding in the body of Christ now. People can't be real to themselves. And when everybody is smiling and jumping, uh, the pastor says, everybody stand up and just wave your hand. Even when there is nothing in you to wave your hand. But because they are commanded everybody to wave their hands. So you just followed along. Not because you have actually followed from within. Discipleship does not give that kind of space. Discipleship allows you to be yourself. Because you are not competing with anybody. So Thomas could be in their midst. And he's simply saying, Lord Jesus, if actually you are the one who rose again, come again. Ah, I said, Lord Jesus, how could you come back only for Thomas? But that shows me that Jesus cared for the individual. So after eight days, according to the scripture we read, the Bible said Jesus came back again. Look at it. After eight days, verse 26, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace to you. Now, but for you to know that he didn't come for the others. For whom did he come this time? He came only for Thomas. So you look at verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. So I could see Jesus. He brought Thomas, said, Oh, yeah, bring your hand, bring that your hand and put it here. So Thomas alone was now bringing his hand to slide it into the, you know, nail print on the, on the palm of the master. And he put his hand into my side. And when he put his hand, he saw where the, the sword pierced him. Then the master must have said, okay, if you want to check the wound on my head, would you like to touch that as well? I was wondering how Jesus was meticulously patient with a brother like Thomas. A Thomas that did not believe when everyone else had believed. Why must Jesus waste time to cultivate the faith of Thomas? Because Thomas is unique. Thomas has a space in the purpose of God. Thomas has been numbered among the apostles. So that Thomas must be given his own space. Even if his own rate of learning is very sluggish, the master was going to give him his own specialized attention. So that, to me, is the peculiarity of discipleship. Discipleship does not lump people together as we are trying to do in our congregational meetings now. Discipleship gives attention to individuals. Individuals can have the ear of the leader and they will treat him as if he's the only person. I was surprised that Jesus came back all the way from heaven just to come and meet Thomas, to answer his question. And look at the Bible. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here, look at my hands, reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God, you can see now the word, my Lord and my God. Thomas didn't say, ah, oh Lord. He didn't say, ah, our God. Uh -uh. It has become my Lord and my God because now it has become his conviction. It has become his own personal experience. That's what discipleship must create for each one of us. Everyone must be able to own the Lord. Everyone must be able to say, my God. Must be able to say, my Lord, my God, my Father. Because you know you have a sense of belonging in Him. He has treated you with dignity. He has given you space. He has trained you the way you should have gone. Now, and the Bible said, look at that. And Jesus said to him, 
Thomas, again for you to know that the whole of this episode, the whole of this session of Jesus coming, it was not for Peter, it was not for James, it was not for John, it was for who? It was for Thomas. I imagine how the other disciples were only watching while Jesus was giving attention to Thomas. How I wish God would give us grace to become men and women who raise other disciples as we saw it in Christ Jesus. He gave attention to individuals. He tallied with individuals. He endured with the sluggishness of the individual. The Bible said, and Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. And because, I mean, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's what Jesus did. So I'm just saying that discipleship as a process is unique for the individual. Now, before we pick Matthew 20, verse 1 to 6, can we now ask Sister Shelley to read the summary up to the point where we have come? Yes, sir. Discipleship is not a big school or factory mass producing in the in identical identical product yes not or a factory mass producing identical products each person is handcrafted into a unique and peculiar individual in god mm. the pace the instrumentality the arrangement of lessons and dealings as determined by the master is also unique. Please take note of that. Wait, Sister Shelley. Take note of what we have said there now. God is no mass producing identical products. God is handcrafting each one of us. Each one of us, we have our personal file in his presence. Our progress report is with him. He knows the last lesson that he has brought to us and how much we have made progress. And if each individual disciple could be given a sense of that uniqueness and peculiarity, they will attend to their discipleship more personally. And they will want to press on to build that personal interaction with God. And even those of us that God may have appointed to go and make disciples, to go and raise disciples for Jesus, this same uniqueness must be clear to us that God wants us to be personal with individuals. God wants us to tarry with individuals. God wants us to give personal attention and peculiar attention to individuals until Christ is formed in them, until they become what God wants them to be. Some may disappoint us, some may betray us, but that does not stop the discipleship process as God gives us opportunity. Go ahead, Sister Shelley. The path each must tread to glory, the portion of service and talents allotted to him is also unique. Yeah. No disciple should compare Christ's dealings with him with another disciple's experience with Christ. Hmm. To whom much is given, much is required. Consider Christ's dealings with that's Peter what we, and Thomas. That's what we have now dealt with. You notice that after Jesus finished talking with Peter, and he said, follow me, we are told that Peter, turning about, he saw another disciple, the one that used to put his head on the breast of Jesus, who asked Jesus, who is it that will betray you? You remember it's John. Now he said, he looked at that disciple and said, So, and what will this man do? And Jesus asked him, What concerns you about that? What if I desire that he should stay here till I come? What business is that to you? I'm dealing with you. You follow me. I know what I will do with this one. So, again, in discipleship, each one must face the Lord. Face the Lord with your discipleship. Face the Lord with what God is dealing with you. 
stop contrasting with someone and say, what of this person? I used to make that mistake many times. When God is dealing with me, God was insisting on certain things that he does not want me to do again. But I see that he is not insisting on uh, my other colleague. And I said, Lord, why not? Eh? But this brother, you are not bothering him. He said, no, 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 no. That's not your business. What I'm dealing with you is what I'm dealing with you. Face what I'm telling you to do. I know what I'm doing with that person. And you don't even know the journey that person is taking. So I began to learn how not to wait on what God is doing with someone else before I obey what God is telling me to do. And that is why by the grace of God, I didn't find myself competing with any man. I don't contrast myself with any brother. I just simply know what Jesus says, go and do and I'm following. And I didn't bother, even if I were the only one that is following the Lord in that manner. I have come to know that my way with God is unique. His dealing with me is unique. And so I cannot continue to bother myself with others. Say, you follow me. Now, that uniqueness must characterize our lives. Each one of you that are listening to me today, have you put your life in Jesus' hand as a disciple? Can you let Jesus deal with you as an individual? If the Lord is insisting and say, this aspect of your life, this thing you are doing, go and drop it. Even if he did not give the same instruction to a fellow sister by your side, you go and do what he tells you to do, and you don't need to judge the other sister who has not been told to do that. Allow that person to be himself. That's why we can be in the same fellowship, we can flow together, and yet my own consecration to the Lord, I don't impose it on another person. I don't insist because God is telling me not to wear this kind of dress. Again, must then become a general rule in the fellowship and say, if you are a disciple, you don't wear this kind of dress again. No, it's not uniformity we are looking for, but conformity to the likeness and the image of Christ. And it must first be inward conformity. When we are being transformed inside, our outside life will begin to reflect Christ. And if it is Christ, very soon people will see that same Christ in his uniqueness in each one of our lives. Now, the last passage we will have considered, which we don't have time to read again, is Matthew 21 to 6 where we are told that he went out and he was recruiting different laborers at different hours. And when he had brought them up, up, he asked each one of them, you go into the vineyard, whatever is right, I will give you, whatever is right, I will give you. When the end came and he decided to administer to all the disciples, I mean, all the laborers, what he chose to give them. One of them said, but this one has just come. Why are you giving him the same thing as us? He said, what's your business about that? Take what is yours and go your way. Isn't it lawful for me, the master, to do what I will with my own? We must give that liberty. Must let it be clear that what Jesus, the master, decides to do with each person is his prerogative so that we will not be finding offense as God is dealing with people that God has given us to work with. Now, please, if you are able, can you correct? Matthew 20 is not 1 to 6. It should be Matthew 20, verse 16. Please take away the iPhone and make it 16, not 1 to 6. It's 2016. That's the passage we quoted in that place. Let's go quickly now to number nine. Number nine. Discipleship is systematic and cumulative. You know, we have read Isaiah 28, verse 9 and 10, that said, line must be upon line, precept must be upon precept. 
dealing with cumulativeness of discipleship. But let's look at Proverbs 16, verse 9, Sister Melissa, and 2024, Brother Clarence. We won't read 28, 9, and 10 again because we've read it just uh, now. Would you like to help us? 16, 9, Proverbs. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. 2024. A man's goings are the Lord's. How can a man then understand his own ways? Mm. All right. So what we are dealing with here is that actually the path and the way in which God wants to make our lives and bring us to where we ought to arrive is God who devises it. It is not in a man to devise his own way if he's a, a child of God, if he's a disciple. It will not be correct that you are the one just struggling to devise your way by yourself. So discipleship allows us to put our hand in the hand of the Lord and He systematically and cumulatively leads us on. Let me again ask Shelley to read the summary in that section for us. Discipleship is not a spurious kind of thing. It is line upon line and a new precept on top of a new precept on top of a previous precept taught and learned. Yes. It is ordered and arranged by the Lord himself. Yes. He exposes the individual disciple to diverse experiences at various times and stages of his development. He gives due meat in due season. That's good. Thank you. He gives them their due meat in due season. If we want to add a scripture to that, we we'll have wanted to put Luke chapter 12. Would you like to check Luke 12 just to add to that uh, set of scriptures we're reading? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make ruler or steward over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? So if God were to appoint you in his house as a steward or as a leader or as a disciple, he expects you to give the brethren, the people, their portion of meat in due season. Discipleship requires being systematic, being cumulative, Precept on top of precept, a line on top of another line, so that there is no confusion, there is progressive growth. And each person is being exposed, uh, every disciple is being exposed to diverse experiences at various times and stages of his or her development. God gives him due meat in due season. Let's take number 10. That's where we are going to stop before we turn to take a bit from becoming like Jesus uh, today. Discipleship shows when you are being discipleship, it will manifest in life and character. Since we said discipleship is not about head knowledge, the result of discipleship will manifest in your life, character, your outlook. You are not pretending, even if you try to do something, what you have become cannot be hidden anymore. Now, we start by looking at that. Let's read Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Sister Shelley, this time you read. Uh, Brother uh, Clarence, Matthew 26, you will help us read 69 to 73. And then, Melissa, you take 1126 of Acts. Can we quickly start? From the New King James Version. Yes. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John 
and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained, untrained men, they marveled. But what did they realize? They realized that they had been with Jesus. Something is reflecting their lives now. They have seen their boldness. And yet they say this kind of boldness, uh -uh, it's not because they are highly educated. They were even untrained. They were barbarians. But then look at them. They say, mm, they have been with Jesus. If your discipleship is progressing, people will see it. We don't need posters. For a genuine discipleship taking place, people in the community they will recognize that something is happening to you. You don't need to be going up and say, you, do you know that I'm a disciple? No, it will show forth. Your lifestyle will prove it. Yes? Matthew uh, 26, 69 to 73, out of New King James Version, yes. it says, Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. Mm. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you are saying. Mm. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him yes. and said to those who were there, These, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. But again, he denied it, died the oath. I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Can you imagine that? Peter didn't know that having stayed with Jesus for three years, six months, Christ has rubbed so much on him. He didn't know that even his language had been affected. He didn't know that his outlook had been affected by his daily interaction with Christ Jesus. You see, when you are in discipleship and you are growing well, you can't hide yourself. Even when you choose to deny uh, your relationship with the Lord, or even with some of us who have been used by God to walk with you into discipleship, even when you say, I don't know them, I don't know them, even the way you are speaking, it will betray you. I had a brother who has stayed with me for some years and I don't know what happened. He just felt like going away. I prayed with him, but he didn't want any identification with me anymore because he thinks these teachings that we are giving has been a hindrance to him. So he traveled far away, 12 hours away. And he located himself in a town, in a city, big city. I asked him, can I recommend you to some other brethren who can ask? He said, no, 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 no. I want to be on my own. I don't like all these things. So he went to a church and they were in a Bible study. And as they were discussing the Bible study, he raised his hand and contributed. At a point they said, eh, let this brother please pray for us. By the time he finished praying, several people came and asked him, I said, oh, how? Oh, you, you have been with Bragville, isn't it? Even the way you are contributing to the scripture, you are like Brother Bile. Oh God. He, he felt, he said, what is the meaning of this? So he ran back. He said, why are you pushing me everywhere? <laughs> everywhere I go, he looks as if your hand is on me. I said, well, I'm not pushing you. It's because the things that we have drunk together cannot but reflect on your life. Except you did not allow this thing to enter you. But you imbibe them. It lived in you. It has changed your life. Better settle down and let us see what God wants to lead you into. So you see, discipleship will set you on a hill. The Bible said you are a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. You can't hide when Christ has walked in your life. You can't hide when you have sat down and drank this thing that we are drinking. 
it will reflect. I used to tell people, I said, if you don't want these messages to affect you, stay away from us. Go away quickly, quickly. Don't come near. Don't say you pick something and you will leave the other and go away. You will damage yourself in that way. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, settle down. Settle down. Christ is not a menace that you'll be ashamed of tomorrow. His life is glorious. I'm happy to be a child of God. I'm happy to be his disciple. I'm happy to follow his pattern of life. I've not seen any other better way to live than to follow this Jesus. So please take note that when you have done well in discipleship, it will show forth. 1126 Act, Sister Melissa. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. They were first called Christians because they just saw Christ in their lives. They saw, I said, ah, these people, they look like little, little Christ. Christ in you is the hope of glory. If what we are learning is helpful, you will soon see that God will continue to make his life manifest in you. Let me just ask Sister Melissa now to read the summary from that section. When the disciple has made real progress in his discipleship relationship with the Lord, his character, deeds, and manner of life and speech show obviously to those around that he has been with Jesus. Discipleship is therefore the ship that brings the willing volunteer pupil or disciple across the ocean of the natural lifestyle. Discipleship is the process that transforms the willing disciple from gulf of the fallen nature into the new spiritual lifestyle, which is the very life of Jesus. It is what changes him from just being a babe in Christ with all the potentials but undeveloped into becoming a full-grown man, into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Mm. When any man is born again, he is a new creation in Christ. He has all the potentials of divine nature living within, but undeveloped and immature. To become a man in Christ, that Christian must be on board this ship called discipleship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sister Melissa, for reading that for us. So let's quickly pick uh, a little thing from Becoming Like Jesus that will look like our summary for today. Uh, we're going to read it and pick some quick lessons. They are just going to summarize the issues we have raised. Let me ask uh, Brother Clarence to start reading at uh, page 53. And you will start by taking the portion, discipleship is a process. Discipleship is a process. The Lord, in his determined counsel, designs a specific curriculum for each disciple and passes, it, passes him through training stages in life. It is a lifelong training process. The Lord working on each disciple's life to make him or her progressively become like Jesus. Mm. The making of disciples to become like Jesus is the Lord's work. Good. But each of us must personally follow and obey him as an apprentice indeed. It is then he will have every chance to make us. Mm. So discipleship is a day by day process and course of life that accumulate that uh, accumulates to become like Jesus Christ. And since God's purpose for every believer is to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ, if it means that everyone who says he is born again, but does not want to enter into discipleship relationship with the master, is not yet ready for heaven. So please take note of this. Even though we are going to say later on that discipleship is voluntary, yet it is mandatory. If you are going to make progress, if you are going to be a partaker of his divine nature, this is the way. 
Actually, what Jesus said we should go and make is we go and make disciples of all nations. Disciples, not just church goers. Let's take note of that. If Jesus had meant anything in your life, then the next thing is for you to take the yoke of discipleship uh, voluntarily and learn of him. Go ahead, sir. Any man who says he is a child of God because of a one-time action of surrendering his life to the Lord Jesus Christ and yet continues in his old ways of life instead of following the master consciously and voluntarily is not ready for God's purpose of salvation to be fulfilled in his life. Discipleship is a process, so it has a beginning, an entry point, and a definite starting point when the pupil voluntarily yields his neck to the yoke of the master to learn of him. It also has an end. Discipleship is not endless. When a disciple has made real progress in his discipleship, it will be clear to everyone that he has been with Jesus. His manner of life and service will show it, but the process has to be completed in order for the goal of discipleship to be achieved. It is possible for someone to withdraw before the process is completed. If that happens, such a person will not be useful to the Lord and to the kingdom of God. Jesus himself says, if anyone lays his hand to the plow and looks back, he is not fit for the kingdom. He is of no use. He is good for nothing. You cannot complete some parts of your discipleship program with the master and leave another part and leave other parts incomplete. He will not accept even 90 percent completion of your discipleship relationship with him at his appearing. If at his appearing, you have not come conformed to his image, you will be at loss. The Bible says, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Matthew 10, 22. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, uh, abominate, excuse me, murderer, sexual immoral, immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 21, 8. Such people will not be allowed to enter into heaven's Jerusalem, no matter how they try and profess they have been born again. The Lord says that some will come to him on that day saying, in your name, we perform miracles and cast out demons. But Jesus will say unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquities. Matthew 7, 23. You must be conformed to his image. That is God's standard and goal for every believer. Thank you very much. Because of our time today, I will please ask you now to complete this particular chapter from the Becoming Like Jesus, which means I'd like you to walk through discipleship is systematic and cumulative. We have discussed that very elaborately. And I just wanted to read that as a part of a summary and a build-up. Discipleship is unique for each disciple. I wanted to note that also. We have discussed it today as elaborately as possible. But I'd like you to read it as your own uh, take-home assignment. Just to finish where we are. And that will bring us to the conclusion of what is discipleship in this particular chapter so that when we come back uh, by god's grace next week we will start with who is a disciple and then we will finish trusting god to help us finish the matter is still quite much but because we are laying very important foundation on concept that's why we are not rushing we feel that if you catch the concept a running in your discipleship experience will be clear and will be easy for you. May the Lord bless you as we go ahead here. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. Would you like to bow your head as we call on God today 
on the issues that we have raised. Would you like to pray and say, Lord, I'm seeing that discipleship is unique and that you are willing to give me my peculiar space if I will allow you, if I will follow you. Some people think that when you are in discipleship, you are being brought into a legalistic form where you are forced to become uniform with everyone else. No, no, no. Far from be, far, far be from that. Discipleship allows you your uniqueness, allows you to grow on your own, allows you by the grace of God in your peculiarity until you can individually, personally, you know, become like him. And he's willing to wait for you. He's willing to give you that space. It will give you personal attention. But you need to give yourself personally to him. If you have not taken this yoke upon you, discipleship cannot start. And will you like to personally say, now that I'm young, now that I'm able, now that I'm strong, it is good that I take this yoke of divine disciplinary daily, where God can wake me up morning by morning and give me the tongue of a disciple. Will you like to ask God for that? You like to offer your heart. It's not by force. It's a voluntary choice you must make. Even though it's mandatory for you to become anything in the hand of God. Would you like to pray with me at this point as we surrender our life to Christ? Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this Bible study again today. Thank you for the privilege you have given us to be able to come together like this. It's our desire and our cry that your mercy will prevail with us and that our understanding of this biblical concept of discipleship will be so settled so that our growth in this way that you have called us into might be steady, might be systematic, and may be cumulative. Lord, for those that are hearing me today, they need to take that decision. They need to say, now, if it is like this, I want to take this yoke. I want to surrender myself to you. I want to follow you as a disciple. Now, those that are making that decision, whether in their private home or whether in the family or whether in the uh, a center setting or whether in the local church, I ask now, Lord, as they take that decision, as they stand before you and say, Lord, Take me in. I want to follow you. Like Elisha began to follow Elijah. Like Joshua deliberately followed Moses. And like Jesus called these 12 disciples and they came to him by themselves. Lord, I ask that you will help us to take these crucial decisions so that the formation of Christ's life within us and the preparation of us for your divine calling and purpose in our lives may actually start in essence. Lord, I ask that you give us such a grace to do so. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. This has been Living Seed. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703-036365. 7681198 Female address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org <laughs>